But it's quite simple. First thing you have to do is survive. And you have to carry out whatever actions you have to do to survive and make your business thrive. Many were reluctant to do it back in March and April and May and June because everybody had different opinions on when it would all come back. But you have to carry out whatever action it is to make sure your business has a chance to survive. This episode of Torpreneur is sponsored by Ventrata. Ventrata is a proven and versatile booking platform built for high-volume tours and attractions. With contactless booking, payment, and check-in solutions, they can get your business back up and running quickly while keeping your staff and customers safe. For more, go to ventrata.com. Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host, Shane Whaley. Hello and welcome to episode 136 of Tourpreneur the podcast where we flatten the learning curve for tour operators and travel professionals around the world. Today, I'm dusting off the Torpreneur Spotlight, and I am swinging it onto Mr. Peter Syme. Many of you know Peter. You will have seen him speak at many different events, whether it be Arrival or Atta. He is an adventure specialist. He is a strategic advisor. He is a digital transformation leader in the travel industry. And more importantly, he is a fellow tourpreneur. In this episode, we go deep. It's 90 minutes. We go right back to the origins of Peter Syme, right from when he left school at 15, how he joined the military, became an officer, how he was working in the bomb disposal unit. We ask him, what's more stressful? (laughs) diffusing bombs (laughs) or running a tour business during a pandemic. We talk about survival. He gives us help and advice on how to survive during the COVID crisis. As I say, this is 90 minutes of value. Get your coffee, your tea, your talisker maybe ready and enjoy this episode. Let me know who else you want to hear on the Tourpreneur Spotlight series. You can find all the show notes and resources and links for this one at tourpreneur.com forward slash one, three, six. Peter, whereabouts do you hold up right now? I'm holed up in Bonnie, Scotland, sunny Scotland. Well, if you believe that, you believe anything because it's anything but sunny. We've got snow, we've got rain, we've got wind, and we've got darkness. But it's fantastic because it is Scotland. Always. And is that where you've pretty much been hunkered down for most of the pandemic? I've been hunkered down here since I left Berlin in March uh, 2020. Uh, I haven't been abroad since then, which is the first time I haven't been abroad in over 40 years for a year. So I'm feeling a bit uh, stir crazy at the moment, if I'm honest. Yeah, same here. Cabin fever, Uh, because it's it's about the same time, because I was due to go to Berlin to see you there and then that's when the world kind of uh, caved in. So in terms of your home situation there in Scotland, so you're married and you have lots of dogs, correct? Yeah, married, two kids, but the kids have left now. Uh, got rid of them as soon as we could. <laughs> and replaced, well, I didn't replace them because we already had dogs before the kids disappeared, but we've now got eight dogs. We do quite a bit of dog rescuing from various countries around the world, mainly Spain. Right. Is it the same breeds that you rescue? No, it's all waifs and strays. We have everything, dash hounds, deer hounds, pointers, spaniels, you name it, they've been here. Yeah. What's your favourite breed, if you had to pick one? Uh, Probably Scottish deer hound. Big, tall, athletic, but very, very docile and lazy, to be honest. Very lazy. Yeah. So how are you coping on a personal level? So obviously you can't travel, which is very frustrating, but in terms of your home life and how you're coping with COVID, what does that look like for you? It's just a situation you have to deal with. And I'm pretty okay dealing with situations. It's not a situation I choose. But the reality is it's a thousand times worse for many people in the world, around the world and developing nations and people who haven't got the, the fallbacks that some of us have got. So it's not great, but you just have to deal with it, deal with it face on, can assess the situation then move on to what you can do uh, stop wishing for things that you can't do because that's just going to annoy you just focus on you can do because it's going to finish and this stuff isn't here forever you've got to you've got to keep faith 
that you're going to get back to traveling and going to get back to doing what you love doing. And you have to have faith to do that. Otherwise, you're just going to go into a, an endless cycle of depression. So it's it's only temporary. It just happens to be temporary for a year or two. It doesn't matter. Carry, carry on. Yeah. Where did you grow up exactly? I grew up in, a, not where I am in Scotland at the moment, a working class central belt of Scotland is kind of split with about 500,000 people living in the rural areas. And the central belt takes about 4 million people. So I was born in the central belt in a, a working class area. I went to school, two different schools there, and left there when I was 15. Were you a good student, Peter? Absolutely not. Combination of me being a pain in the backside and the school not being that good on hindsight. A bit different from now. Uh, can education system here is pretty good, but the school I went to, and when I look back on it, the average then was about 10% of people went on at university. Our school was averaging less than 1%. So it was a pretty rough but But you've got to take the positives out of everything. It was a rough, difficult school, but it taught you how to look after yourself. You maybe not got the I certainly didn't get the academics uh, qualifications out of it because I left before I got a chance to sit my exams. But it certainly taught you a lot of life lessons that you could then carry on into the future. So when you were 15, what were your ambitions in life? To get the hell out of where I was in Scotland. Uh, to put that in context, that was late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I was due to leave school at the start of 81. The UK and Scotland, particularly at that point, was a depressing place. There was mass unemployment. So, and you got, again, we didn't have all this digital stuff and social stuff and all these opportunities you can, can create in five minutes. All you really seen was what was around your environment. So your local, local environment was your environment one or two channels on the TV was your only escapism. So my simple strategy was leave as quickly as possible and just go somewhere. And the route I took was uh, I joined the army. How old were you when you joined the military? I signed up when I was 15 and joined straight after my 16th birthday. And what was that like for you? Because you sound like, and forgive me if I'm incorrect here, but you sound like you were quite a rebellious kid, certainly strong-willed, and then to go into the military... How did you adapt to that? Weirdly, because the school brief to the military, because they obviously asked the school when you applied to join, the school brief to the military was, do not recruit this guy. <laughs> he, won't, <laughs> he won't last a week. He never takes any discipline. He won't do what he's told, et cetera, et cetera. So I was, I was exceedingly lucky. And you'll hear that word a lot in my life, lucky, because I have been lucky a lot. I was lucky to get into the military. And the reason I wanted in, it was nothing to do with being in the military. It's just that I'd seen films and I'd seen stuff on TV about the military running around the world and getting to travel, and I was desperate to see the world. And I thought, this is a way I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see the world. So you either learn instantly in the military or your history. I learned to keep my mouth shut, and if I was going to be successful, open my mouth at the right time rather than the wrong time and just buckle down because the rewards were going to be worth it. Was that where you first got the travel bug? Yeah, for sure. That was the reason I went I went into the military. Before they even took me, they sent me away up to the north of Scotland for a couple of months because I wasn't young enough to get in. Uh, sent me on kayaking, mountaineering, climbing, and all outdoor stuff. And the, the instructors that were teaching us were talking about where they'd been all around the world. So it was just inspiring. And then when you join, again, you're not once you're out of training, you're off you're off and running, you're you're off around the world straight away. And that was everything to me was just a, I need to see the world and travel. Prior to joining the military, I hadn't left Scotland. I hadn't been outside Scotland. So you went from going in as a recruit, and at some point, from what I understand, the military then said, we want to put you through officer training school in Sandhurst, correct? And that was nine years off. <laughs> right. It came as a shock to me because it was never on the plan. It, was never, it wasn't part of my plan. I was working hard doing what I was doing. Military is fairly simple. And like all situations, you weigh it up when you go there. Straight away, I knew within weeks, I knew if you're really, really fit, you get away with a lot. So I made sure I was exceptionally fit and, and I was exceptional to be in the top 1% of fitness anywhere I went in the military because, it, it, one, it allows you to do your job better and, two, it keeps a lot of grief away from you if you're exceptionally fit. The second thing you, you pick up very quickly if you're aware is there's a time and place to open your mouth. If you don't open your mouth, you ain't going anywhere. You're not going to be successful. So you have to open your mouth. You just have to be reasonable, intelligent when you open your mouth and question things because everybody thinks for the outside, it's all 
do this, do that, do the next thing. And it's, it's completely not like that. Obviously, there's discipline and orders, but it is a questioning environment as well because everybody has value and everybody has different trainings and different backgrounds again, to make up the teams. So it is a questioning environment and you have to step forward, you have to volunteer and you have to put yourself forward. And if you do then, do these two things, keep yourself fit and can put yourself forward, you're, you're going to get noticed because it's a hierarchical system and the system only works if they promote people up there. So over the period of nine years, I'd probably been a pain in the backside enough and someone crazy enough said, do you want to go to Sanders? Which I just laughed at them, to be honest, because the normal career for someone like me would be to spend 20 odd years going all the way through the ranks and then maybe commission as a, an LE officer, which is a late entry and miss out the Sanders stuff. But to go to Sanders as someone with no academic qualifications basically was unheard of. It didn't happen at that time. That was around 1990 that you joined Sandhurst? Yeah, but 1990 I went and yeah, then I lasted six more years and left in 96. Let's talk about business. What are you applying in your business today as a result of what you learned in the military? If you've been successful in the military, and not everyone is, I mean, people have bad experiences in there or average experiences, but if you've been successful in there, you just carry out your daily tasks in life in a slightly different way forever. So I'm a big believer in discipline. And when I say discipline, I don't mean yes, sir, to, no, sir, three bags, full, sir. But if you're disciplined to do things that you don't really want to do, it is a reliable habit that ends up in outcomes. So can in today's world, you see motivation this and motivation that and and people trying to motivate people, discipline is a damn sight more reliable than motivation. And just be disciplined to do stuff that you don't really want to do. But if you do it often enough, it's going to get you somewhere. Yes. Somebody asked in the group, I think it might have been fellow Scott Chris Torres, is like, what's more difficult, running a tour business during COVID or a bomb disposal unit? <laughs> yeah. And I spent um, four, uh, about four years in one disposal unit and that obviously focuses you that's attention it focus detail and stuff like that and it also taught me that i'm much more of a journalist that incredible attention to focus to one subject isn't really me which is not a good thing if you're in that job yeah <laughs> there is jobs in life that are hard and there's jobs in life that are easy but every single job has things you can take away and it sets you up for the next one and it sets you up for the next part of life and all the military was was to me it was just 31 or 32 or whatever it was when I left, it just set me up for the rest of my life because nothing has been as difficult since the military. Again, nothing, I've been in big business, small business, nothing has been as difficult as when I was in the military. What was the hardest thing you had to do in the military that you can talk about? The again, jobs you were given that you had to carry out. There's some of the things you had to see again and deal with people getting hurt, people getting injured, people getting killed, and not just your colleagues, but the people in the destinations where you were sent to to carry out the job. I mean, everybody's seen it on TV. The, the locals don't exactly come out of any conflict well, do they? So just seeing stuff and having to deal with that and carry on with your job is is quite hard at the time. Because you're in, you're in a system and you're disciplined and you, you're focused, you just get on with it. It's after it, kind of, sometimes quickly after it or sometimes years after it, sometimes decades after it that people sit down and think back and you certainly have a different outlook on life looking back than when you were actually doing it. You got to remember when you're young, you're invincible. I thank you for your service, Peter, because I couldn't do it. I read all the books and I read military history and all of that, but I even do war gaming on tabletop stuff. But I know for a fact that that's my limit. I, I couldn't have done what you did and you know what your comrades did in the military. So I, I thank you for your service. You got to mind, we, Everybody's in the military. <laughs> They're all there because, they, well, certainly the UK military. We volunteer. So <laughs> we're all there because we want to be there. And, and they're getting a huge amount of that. Obviously, there's cases of people can having damage and can mental illness and all their stuff after it and physical damage after it as well. But we all stepped up and we all volunteered. I'm a big believer in so much at the moment we see the negative about military, people being injured, people being killed, people with mental health issues. All of that's true, and I'm not little in it by any means and these people should be helped to the, to the utmost but we don't focus enough on what the benefits of military service bring to the actual people that do because the vast majority of people that serve come out much better people than they went in that being said do you think that national service should be brought back 
no. <laughs> It'd be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say that? Uh, when you make people do things they don't want to do, it tends not to have great results. Uh, yes, it would be good for some people. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But would it be good for society as a whole? No. Would a national programme where someone who was young, 16 to 20, could choose what they wanted to go and do, maybe a bit of military service, maybe a bit of volunteering with a charity, maybe go and work in, with the UN somewhere, maybe go and dig wells in Africa, maybe go and inoculate lots of people with a vaccine. If there was something that young people could do that was for society and for the population across the globe as a whole, I would be a big in favour of that. But telling people to go into the military, which is not somewhere you want to be if you don't want to be. What made you leave the army in the end? Uh, the army. <laughs> they, they invited me to leave. Uh, and like all careers, it's a tree, you're climbing the ladder. I got to a stage where what was being offered in front of me wasn't the career that, that I wanted. So they were basically saying, like, it's our way or the highway. And they're very clever at doing that. Can they offer jobs that you maybe not want to do? In my situation, they offered me my dream job, the last job I got offered me, it was actually my dream job, which was heading up the venture training for the army by coming back to Scotland and working in the Highlands. Uh, so that, in theory, would have been a dream job. But from a career point of view, I also knew it was my last job because once you do that job, you can't go back into commanding, commanding big, big groups of men. So I knew it was a, a career-ending job. So I decided to part company. And at that time, I had two young children as well. So there was questions about whether you can look after kids and all of that stuff. Sure. What did you do after you left the army? I've only ever had two jobs since I left the army, both for American companies. One first one was for a company called Cargill, which at that time was the biggest private company in the world, which is a food commodity chemical company headquartered in the US. A, over 130 years old, started by a Scotsman, uh, but now definitely a US company. And my job was to trade commodities, barley, wheat, soyas. There's green screens sitting on a computer all day and on phones, phoning customers, phoning farmers, buying, selling. Taught me a lot about money, which I didn't learn in the army. In these days, you didn't learn much about money. You learned nothing about money. Uh, that taught me a lot about money and taught me about margins, taught me about extremely small margins. So I enjoyed it from a learning perspective, but from a, a life perspective of sitting in front of a green screen all day, that wasn't going to last. So I changed to another American company, which was a distribution company, huge thing again. And back in them days, it was already doing several billion turnover, and it was all distribution of IT products. And I was responsible for the Scottish operation, but then ended up being responsible for several more countries. And I was lucky, and I keep coming back to this. My job sort of developed into I was getting sent to fix the broken businesses in various countries, which was fun for the first few times. That was at the beginning of the e-commerce revolution, late 99, 2000, 2001. Uh, identified what was happening. I thought I identified what was happening. So I was lucky enough to get the chance to present to the board to say, look, we need to change our strategy. Again, this is happening whether we like it or not. The old ways of doing business, we need to change. Everybody laughed in the boardroom except one person, and I was lucky enough the person that wasn't laughing was the CEO. So he basically plucked me out of the operational role and then gave me the, the job of strategy for the digital business until I ended up departing the company. Was that ISA? Yeah, yeah. So you, you held various posts there, including general manager for three countries, sales director, MD responsible for e-business. You, you didn't have a degree, right? When you were in the military, they didn't put you through that? So what was it about you, other than, you know, an impressive resume of being an officer in the military, what was it about yourself at that stage where you were given those responsibilities by ISA? It was nothing to do with the military. I mean, the business world doesn't get a bit better, I think, but certainly at them points, there was no real understanding of the military, and in certain cases there still isn't. So your, your military history does not get you jobs unless you go into certain jobs. If you go into the security industry, et cetera, it gets you jobs, but... That was a pure commercial play. So a uh, military background doesn't get you that, that job. You know what talks in big business, money talks. And it's as simple as that, money talks. And when I was responsible for turning in some loss-making businesses, they ended up making a lot of money. So 
the CEO took notice that that business was losing, now it's making money, how's that happened? And by hook or crook, I'd made it happen. Therefore, it's, it's the same game as the military, isn't it? If you make things happen and you get results, people take notice and then ask you, could you do this? Or are you interested in this? So how did you make that jump from the corporate world, so those two roles you had, into the exciting world of travel? In the last year in the corporate world, the parent company in the USA, a company called Daisy Tech, had just gone bust. We had a job of protecting the European businesses and we did everything we could, but it was obvious that we were going to have to make changes in the business. The business was put up for sale. Uh, the buyer came in. I wasn't keen on working for who the buyer was that bought the UK business. So in the background to that, because that didn't happen overnight, that was a journey of certainly several months into it, over a year. I had decided I was leaving the corporate world and I had been looking to get into something that came, my, my passion was, which was travel. And I'd still been travelling all the time in the corporate world, but never seen anything apart from airports and hotel rooms and <laughs> boardrooms. So I wanted to get back into real travel and adventure. And in the background, even though I was still employed, I basically bought a, a broken whitewater rafting company in, in Scotland. Uh, and that was my backup plan for when I eventually got the exit from the, the corporate world. What was broken about it? Uh, the owner ran a great operation from an operation point of view, as in from the point of the experience, delivering the experience, that was all good. But the financial setup of it was broken and the owner did a runner to another country. Oh, wow. That was Splash? Yep which you've owned since uh, 2003 until today, correct? Yeah, I've, I've kept it. It was the first one and I've kept it. That's not to say I'll keep it forever, but I've kept it till now. So when you got in there and you had to fix these financial problems, how did you go about doing that? I employed a couple of people straight away, which was a risk because I didn't really have the money to pay them. But I needed people to focus on the doing of the delivery of the experience for the guests. Because I, obviously coming from a business world, I was like, I could spend my, my time here delivering the guest experience. And I would quite enjoy that because I do enjoy it. But I'm never going to fix the business or build the business of doing that. So I employed a couple of people to do that. And then I went straight on to what's going to fix the business from restructuring the financials to doing what had to be done, which was sell more, get more clients, get more customers very, very quickly. So even in these early days, made sure the digital presence was up and running. I knew how to SEO sites in them days, and it was a lot easier than what it is these days. So within six months, we were dominating every search for, for the, the activities we wanted in Scotland. And we went, when I took over, it was doing 2,000 customers a year. Within three, four years, it was doing 10,000. Then we took it up after that. Going back to those early years, so you take over the business, what did you quickly realize that you didn't know about running your own business? The stuff to do with money, I knew from running P&Ls for companies. But it's still different when it's your own money yeah, <laughs> rather yeah. than someone else's money. So, And the other thing it was hard, which I hadn't really appreciated, is for a long time, because from a very early time in the military, I think it was only in six months or a year, very quickly I had responsibility for other people, so I had other people to tell what to do. And then I went through a period of 15 years in the military, uh, six years in business, always having other people in the team where I could tell what to do uh, in quite big teams, kind of anything from 50s to 200 to 250. So having big teams of people to tell what to do to stepping out to running your own business when you've got two people who are fully employed looking after the customers, that means there's only you left to do all the other mountain of jobs that you have to get on with. I didn't appreciate how annoying and difficult that would be until I started doing it, but you just have to do it. Eventually, I got rid of the finance side because I could afford to bring a bookkeeper in, get rid of the customer communication side because you can bring office manager in. You just work through it on what do I want to get rid of because I don't like doing or I'm not very good at doing, and you just have a tick list and, and work through it, generate more cash to make sure you can pay for it, get rid of that, grow the company, respin the wheel. In the few years that I've got to know you, I've always been impressed by your thirst for knowledge. And I'd love to know what books or courses that you've read or studied that you feel have contributed to your success as a tourpreneur. I've read a lot of books over the years. I'm yeah. a bit as a sponge with knowledge, so the books are in the thousands. Uh, I don't read as much now as I used to. 
but I still read a lot of books in a year. Can it be north of fifty books in a in a year? I still do courses, and I dedicate a minimum of twenty percent of my year to learning, and that's in the calendar. So it's at the beginning of the year it goes into the calendar, and I pick courses I want to go on or retreats or whatever it is, but it's going to be a learning experience for a minimum of twenty percent of of my working year. Some recent ones I've done that thoroughly enjoyed, and there's some lessons coming out of them. I did an entrepreneurial startup course, high growth startup course with MIT, which was probably one of the best courses I've ever done. It was a whole semester squeezed into about five days. So it was all 18 hour days. It was face to face. And it was just, it was absolutely a, a really good course because the process that they went through, I've done multiple startups. And if I had used that process, I wouldn't have messed up a lot of the stuff I messed up in startups. And I wouldn't have had the, the heart, it basically makes the journey easier. It makes you consider things that you didn't consider because you just jump into it and carry on. I've also done some courses recently via Scott Galloway, who's a professor at NYU, who's got a good digital online courses based on strategy, brand, all digital for obviously the times we're in, which although I enjoyed them, the content was fantastic, just a learning thing. I'm finding learning digitally harder than I do find face-to-face. Now, that might just be me because certain age, certain time, but I'm finding I'm only learning at about 50% of the rate when I do it digitally than I would if I was face-to-face with a group. Why do you think that is, Peter? I think it's harder to stay focused when you're on a digital environment, a digital course, because there's so many other things you can get distracted by and things can be pinging, Whereas if you're in a classroom environment or study environment and you're working with a group or the can the, the instructor teaching you, you're not going to go and answer your phone or can look at your messages and all the rest of it. But when you're in your, your study and you're working on your computer and you're trying to learn and things are pinging all over the place, it's just so easy to get distracted. And, and the other thing is you just don't get that one-to-one connection with either the person teaching or the cohort of the group who half the learning is with the cohort and with all the things you bounce about, someone comes out with this idea, another idea, even though digital tools do facilitate that, it just doesn't impact the same way as face-to-face. Yeah, I would agree with that. I've, I've uh, I signed up for quite a few courses last year and, and I've cut back on them this year for that reason that I also find it really difficult to focus. I, I have to switch everything off my phone you know, Facebook, everything, and just focus on the lesson or the class because otherwise my mind, and it's the same also with sign up some very good conferences and it's just not the same as being in the auditorium where you're watching a speaker. You have to play it off against the financial cost that you pay for these things. Yeah. Digital knowledge is now available at a fraction of the price that doing it for real is. So can the education industry has been disrupted more than the tra- travel industry has been disrupted a lot, but the education industry has been absolutely ripped apart because in the future, you're not going to get people paying 100, 150,000 pounds for knowledge that's freely available online at much, much, much lesser cost. I agree. I also think the other challenge, I know Brian Chesky at Airbnb was talking about this year being a year of focus for him. And that's what I've been hearing from a lot of tourpreneurs who last year was suddenly like, wow, I now have time to study SEO or SEM because unfortunately we're at home, but signed up for so many courses that they ended up not finishing them or rushing them or not even starting them because there's such a huge choice out there when it comes to online learning. How do you score or how do you evaluate a course that you see? What are the vital ingredients that it needs to have for you to sign up for it, Peter? A bit of research on who's delivering it. And to me, it's the main person delivering. Pretty easy to find out anything about anybody, how many videos they got, podcasts, articles they've written. So straight away, I go and look who's delivering this. And even if they're not delivering it on every single module and they've got people helping them, I want to see who's been responsible for putting it together because I have to be confident that I'm actually going to learn something. Therefore, that's my first thing is research, quite a lot of research to feel, am I aligned with this person delivering this? Has this person got interesting, challenging things to say and highlight? And if they have, well, then I'm interested. If they haven't, I'm not that interested. I'm not saying that it's not valuable because it may be valuable for someone else, education is a very personal thing. What's good for me is not good for someone else and vice versa. 
And secondly, it's then how is it delivered? How is it? Is it just video and is it just talking head? Or is there an interactive bit? Is there a cohort bit where you go off with the groups and work in within groups? All of that does play a part as well. But first, who's delivering it? What's the content? Have they got authority to be able to do it? And then how is it being delivered? Yeah, I would I would agree with that. And I would also say to our listeners, ask in your in your networks as well. If you come across a course, ask if someone else has studied it or if they know the people involved, because there are some excellent courses out there, but there's also a lot of crap. But there's a lot of money for old rope out there. And you don't want to A spend a lot of money on on a crap course. But also it's still a time commitment. You know, it's time you could be spent on other things. There's another thing because we're in the digital world, it's a uh, and this impacts on what we do, travel and how we market and how the rest of it is in a digital world, we have a paradox of choices. The more more choices people get, the less they choose. So again, let's jump into our world, let's jump onto an OTA platform can with endless choices. Mm. That confuses people. Again, it's the paradox of choice. The more choice people get, the less they choose. It's like in real life, you go into a restaurant, or when we can go into a restaurant again, you sit down and the restaurant's got five choices on it, or you've got another restaurant where it's got 35 choices on it, and someone just sits there and scrolls through the 35 because they can't make up their mind. It's the paradox of choice. It's true. And I think what we all need to ask ourselves as well, Peter, is you know, where do we need to focus this year? Where can we move the needle? For myself, I'd signed up for courses like copywriting, SEO, WordPress and all that. And I'm, you know, I don't need any of that. I can hire people who, who do it. I need to focus on the craft of interviewing. That's what I do daily. And my success with the Torpreneur podcast is being a better interviewer. So this year is all about focusing on, I'm doing a, a journalism course. I'm doing a course at Berkeley, which is storytelling with sound, which again, that's been a good course. What surprised me the most there was the amount of homework I've got to do and like proper homework, not go away and answer these five questions, but go and put a project together and it gets evaluated. It's hard, but it's what I need because that's where my focus needs to be this year. For sure. And the tour operators that are listening to this, we are in a complex world and our industry is super complex. And I try my hardest to simplify everything down. And tour operators at the moment, you just have to simplify it down because it, it can become, and it is becoming, I know from speaking to them, a bit overbearing at the moment. But it's quite simple. First thing you have to do is survive. And you have to carry out whatever actions you have to do to survive and make your business thrive. Many were reluctant to do it back in March and April and May and June because everybody had different opinions on when it would all come back. But you have to carry out whatever action it is to make sure your business has a chance to survive. You then, once you're in a comfortable place that you know you're going to survive, you have to start to align your business with what's going to be the new future. What's the new customers who are now digital first more than they've ever been? They were digital before, but now they're super digital because we've had decades and days. The days are very long at the moment, but the decades are fast. So you have to align your business with what customers are going to be like as we come out of this, be that changing product, be it changing communication, be it changing your technology, just changing your whole way to be aligned with these customers. And then you need to get all the tools, all the stuff you were talking about in place in order to let you thrive when the business comes back. So it's survive first, align with how the new customers are going to be, and then set the business up in a way that is going to thrive in the new world. I've got a couple of statements here that I, I wanted to run by you. And it's interesting, Peter, I spoke to quite a few of our listeners and say, you know, who's got questions for Peter or observations on Peter? And, and I don't know if you're going to be flattered by this or not, but it surprised me that quite a few people came back. Obviously, first of all, you have immense respect in the industry, pretty much because A, you speak your mind, which everyone loves about you. And secondly, you went out of your way to speak to God knows how many tour operators during the pandemic, offering help, offering support. And that went a long way in the industry. And some people said, oh, Peter, he's like the Yoda character from Star Wars in the experience industry. And they also said, you are like the Mr. Miyagi. What they were getting at when I said, well, what do you mean exactly? And they said, well, because he's very wise and he'll come out with a statement that I have to go away and think about. It's not like, hey, go and do this. I have to try and understand what Peter is saying. And I just pulled out a couple of statements here and I, and I figured if we could go through these, it would be fun. So one of the comments you gave 
And bear in mind, I think these were in 2019, so this is all pre-COVID, but I am on a mission to get operators in the sector to focus on digital leadership and execution in the same way that they focus on executing fantastic customer experiences in person. What did you mean by that exactly? Yeah, but first of all, before I answer that, just on the old Yoda stuff, just be careful of anybody who's got experience because <laughs> experience is in the past <laughs> by definition, right? And it has got some strengths, but it's got huge weaknesses. And the faster the world speeds up and the more digitalized the world becomes, the less valuable experience is. So just be a little bit careful with old gray beards like me mouthing off because we're not moving to the past, we're moving to the future. And some younger people have got a better idea about the future than I have. But we all agree customer experience is everything. But where operators are great at and where they're on the whole are pretty poor at is they really focus all their energy, all their time, and all their effort in making that customer experience fantastic when they arrive at their destination. So whatever it is, a food tour, or a bike tour, a walking tour, it doesn't matter. They make that experience brilliant. And on the whole, the industry is very good at that. Not my opinion. If you do all the data search, getting the, the rankings and uh, ratings of uh, tours and experiences versus restaurants or versus transport, et cetera, it always scores higher. So we're, operators are really good at giving a live experience. But they need to think about how do we do that customer experience in a digital way prior to the customers arriving. So we all know the customer journey. The customer goes through a, a dream and a plan and a booking, an experience and a sharing journey, right? We need to be as good in these digital periods where the customer is engaging with our content and with potentially with our booking. We need to be as good in these places as we are at delivering the customer experience face-to-face. -face. Who do you see doing that well right now? Or pre-COVID probably was a better way of putting it. This goes against some of the stuff I say, but the OTAs are actually quite good at it. Not all of them, but some of the OTAs are good at it because they understand the customer journey and they've got the data to understand the customer journey. So if you understand where your customer is at any stage, you're going to be more able to interact with them in a digital way to service them. So the bigger companies tend to be good at this because they have the more resources and the data to do it. We've been swamped in data now. I'm swamped in data myself at the moment. The value of data is decreasing the quicker this all speeds up. It's the analysis of the data where the value is. And we have a massive weakness of, in the industry, in my opinion, of people who can really look at data and analyze it and draw conclusions out of it and then apply them to the people, the guests that are going to do. At the moment, we're quite good at using data for marketing and for placing the right ad at the right place at the right time for the person to convert. But the experience of dragging out the trends in that data and how we can give a customer a much better experience is something that the industries, I think all industries are lacking, that we really need some really world-class data analysis on our data. But I do think the bigger companies and the bigger tour operators in the industry, Intrepid, and big tour operator, they do a really good job of following this customer experience offline as well as online. And customers of the future, guests will value brands much more on the experiences they deliver than the actual service of the product. So it's the whole holistic experience and interaction that they've had with that brand from start to finish will be incredibly more important to the customer than the actual product or the experience they bought. And how did they relate to them and digitally on the web? Was the website approachable? Did they have multiple community? I wanted to speak to them in WhatsApp, but they didn't have a WhatsApp communication. I wanted to speak to them in WeChat, but there was no way of doing it. You have to be doing what you do face-to-face -face in a digital environment. And do you feel that this can be done on a budget? So if you're talking about a small tour operator as opposed to an interpreter or, or a large OTA, can smaller tour operators pull this off? It's incredibly difficult. It's hard. But <laughs> just because it's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. When you're a one-man band or two people or three people, it's incredibly hard because all of this stuff is getting harder, not easier. But then you've got to think, well, what is my strategy as a business? Why am I in business? Strategy is pretty simple at its core, really simple at its core. Those that execute on the most difficult things win. 
if you go into business and then just copy everything that's out there, you're not going to win. You might do some business, you might get some money coming in, but you're just getting on a hamster wheel of churning it around. So if you want to be in business and do well in business, you have to come up with a strategy that's going to be difficult and then execute on it. So you have to decide what you can deliver and what you can. And in today's world, you have to be guided by the customer. And it's not acceptable anymore for an, uh, an operator to say, well, I've got online booking and that should be enough for them. That's not enough for them. The customer wants to phone you, customer wants to email you, customer wants to Facebook message you, wants to Google message you, wants to WeChat you, wants to WhatsApp you, wants to Instagram you. And the customer is in command, not you. And if you want to grow your business, you have to be set up in a way to en enable all of these channels. And when I'm on this, and this won't go down well with all the, the sole operators out there, but it is just a reality. And if you're a single person running a tour operator, doing the experiences, delivering the experiences, having to cope with all of this, you've got some hard choices coming up because you're not going to make it as a single operator. You need to partner and get partners in, or you need to build quickly or finance quickly to employ people because this is going to be so difficult going forward to survive as a you can become an Uber driver of tours and activities because you can subcontract all of this stuff to platforms who will do a lot of it for you and just give you the customer. And if you're happy doing that, that's fine. There's, there'll be people out there that's happy doing that. And if it works for you, it's fine. But you will be at risk because at any change in a multinational company, you will be the one that suffers and you won't see it coming. It will just hit you and you will have no power over that. The other route is to get your business in a way where you're working with other people, you've brought a partner in, you're co-founder, you've got some cash together to employ somebody. But doing all of this on your own in this digital environment, you're going to have to be Superman or Superwoman. Yeah, I mean, I, I can even relate to that, but you're not just doing the podcast. I, know I have an editor now who edits the show. I have a show notes writer. I can't focus on all the marketing channels and do the research for guests and everything else that goes into making a podcast. I've had to outsource. If I want to grow, if I just want to stay small, fine, I can do it all myself. But I came to that decision a while ago, and I feel that the show has improved because of that. Have you considered lecturing or putting a course together on uh, digital leadership in the tours industry, Peter? Yeah, I'm neck deep in the middle of a course put together at the moment. Yeah, I was working on it this morning. I'll be working on it uh, next week again. It's not my course; it's for uh, Edinburgh University. But we are building a course. That it's not for tours and activity operators. It's for everybody in the travel industry. It's a digital course for the travel industry, but it's it's hugely in depth because it's for a university. So it'll be July summer before it's finished. And when you've completed that, would you consider creating one just for the experiences industry? Probably be able to extract quite a bit out of that one, and then just and use it for the experiences industry. It will be very relevant to the experiences industry anyway, because something that our industry needs to realise is we're not first here. <laughs> the hotel industry and the airlines have gone through this. We're all interconnected. We all depend on each other. COVID should have demonstrated that. If the airlines are not working and the accommodations are not working, tours and activities are not working. So we've all got interdependencies between the industry and the hotel industry has gone through quite a bit of what we are going through at the moment. The only difference at the moment is all speeding up even faster than it was before. Again, days are long, decades are fast. We're in the time of speed. Everything is speeded up. The customers, when they start rebooking again, start experience again, will be different customers. They're not just going to be how they were pre-COVID. We've now got literally hundreds of millions of customers who have conducted transactions online who hadn't conducted transactions online pre-COVID. So we've got a different customer base coming out of this. Now, they may have not conducted transactions with tour companies during COVID because we're all shut, but because they've been buying their groceries online, because they've been buying their booze online, because they've been doing all their bills online, which they hadn't been before, they are now digital first customers. We now have people who have never used a computer who are digital first because they've discovered the wonders of it because of COVID. So everybody in tourism really needs to be aware that the guest journey you had pre COVID isn't necessarily the same guest journey that's going to be after COVID. And that's an opportunity. That's not a threat. That's an opportunity, a huge opportunity. 
Yeah, there was uh, another observation you made. It was a warning, and it dovetails into that answer where you said the small operator who makes up the vast majority of this industry is sleepwalking into a future with a smile on their face because they love what they do. They're not aware of the digital tidal wave that will sweep over them and change control or maybe even kill the businesses that they've built with heart and soul over the years. I thought that was very powerful, Peter. Yeah, and it leads on for that. You've got small operators, which I include myself in there. I'm a small operator. You have two choices to make. You become the Uber model where you work with many platform partners and you subcontract all that customer acquisition, customer communication, customer payment, get rid of all that stuff that you don't have time to do or you think you don't have time to do and just focus 100% on making sure the customers get the best possible experience when you're face-to-face with them. There is nothing wrong with that model if you're a trusting person. I tend not to be, (laughs) but it's more because I understand big business and how big business works and big business works with money first, consequences second. So if you put yourself in that position, it may work great for a year, may work great for five years, but it, the pain's in the post. You're going to be disrupted at some point, and you're not going to have any control or less control because you haven't built up a database, you haven't built up relationships with customers, and the only thing that matters in the whole of this is a relationship with a customer. All the rest of it is just technical goo-goo, really. The thing that wins every time is the relationship with customers, but you can't just have a face-to-face relationship. You have to have a digital relationship. So I'm not saying don't do that because there is definitely a market for thousands and thousands of tour guys just to get rid of all of this stuff, work with four or five platforms and fill their calendar and make, make a life. But they can't come back and complain when these platforms change strategy and their business disappears. That is the risk of doing that. I mean, I, I may have fallen foul of this myself. A tourpreneur reached out to me last week and said, do you want a clubhouse invite, Shane? And my first reaction was, no, I do not. I don't want another social media distraction. But that could be something that could end up killing podcasting. And I've not done any due diligence or research. My first reaction is, no, it's different. I don't understand it. And also, I'm, I'm trying to be more focused. But I think that's a good example, even for tourpreneurs, of not looking at the new technology that's coming our way. Again, look at history. We'll go to the hotels and, and independent hotels. Go and speak to independent hotel owners, not the Marriott and not the big companies who have got the resources. Go and speak to the independent hotel owners who own one to four to five hotels. Speak to the owner. Talk to them about their journey over the last 20 years and then decide if that's a journey that you want to go down or do you want to do it different. There's no right or wrong here. You know, I'm not standing here telling people what to do. There is no right or wrong, but I do think People like me and others in the industry have got a duty to highlight what we know so operators can then make a choice based on knowledge rather than just being sold something that um, I know at some point is going to come back and bite me. Are you looking to upgrade to a booking platform that will allow you to increase sales, distribute your product more efficiently and reduce operating costs? Then you need to speak to Ventrata. Ventrata is a proven and versatile booking platform built for high volume tours and attractions and is trusted by Big Bus Tours, Historic Tours of America, RATP Group, City Sightseeing and many more to power all their sales channels globally. They have a comprehensive platform that will allow you to manage and view live sales information from multiple channels in a single dashboard. Right now, Ventrata are offering a special pandemic recovery setup and payment plan to any business that books a demo before the 19th of March. For more, go to ventrata.com forward slash tourpreneur. You wrote something on LinkedIn at time of recording, so this was today, that as we rebuild, we have to do better, folks, or tourism will promise much and fail to deliver. What did you mean exactly by that? There is an argument, and don't get me wrong, I didn't really put a huge amount of brain thought power into this pre-COVID, but if you actually look at the travel industry as a whole and really dig deep in the analysis of it, we actually had a disaster before the disaster. So everybody thinks 2019, it was statistically the best year in travel history. If you measure it on a money terms by how much money was swizzling around the system, how much funding was going on, how much jobs there were. So in one look at it, everything was rosy. 
But then if you look at the other things and look at the over tourism, look at the impacts on certain destinations, look how the locals in certain destinations were being impacted. Then you look at can, what is the value that that tourism is bringing to that destination, that island, et cetera, versus what was it extracting from that destination. We were actually building something that was going to break at some point anyway. Now, COVID has come along and broke it more than we could ever imagine. And it's given the industry time to rethink. I do think when we come out of this and when we start trading again, there's going to be a dash for cash. Because remember, going back to survive first, people need cash to survive. So there'll be a dash to cash initially. But the industry really needs to start thinking about different metrics apart from just profit. Because if we don't, regulators will come in and make us think about different metrics rather than just profit. And we really need to start building from the destination and the people in the destination back the way, whereas we've gone through 20, 30 years of doing it the other way. And entrepreneurs, businesses, all the rest of it have decided they're going to be travel businesses and they've imposed on destinations, they've imposed on locals without necessarily delivering value to them. Yeah, I would advise our listeners to follow you on LinkedIn in particular, and I will add your LinkedIn profile to the show notes today where we can find those at tourpreneur.com forward slash 136, because I can already see you only posted this five hours ago, and there's a really good discussion going on on your page around that, and we can only cover so much on this podcast episode. I did want to talk with you about your experiences when COVID hit. So talk us through those early days. So you get to arrival Berlin, that's cancelled, ITB is cancelled, you come home to Scotland. What happened next for you? Well, it was actually in Berlin. Obviously, we, we had a, a mini on-arrival conference where the people who were there, we did the best job we could to kind of put some lessons, et cetera, on and discussions. We had lots of networking, lots of group stuff. So there was still good work done in Berlin, but I was very clear already there that, don't get me wrong, I wasn't thinking the size of disaster that we currently are in, but I knew it was a disaster for 2020. I knew the whole year was chaos. I knew that straight away. So I wrote an article in the pub in Berlin, which was basically a step-by-step guide of what operators should do, uh, because this is going to be worse than most of you think it's going to be. And that, although I said about experience, be careful experience earlier, that was based on experience. I was running businesses in 2008 when the financial crash happened. 65% 65% of my profit was exposed to corporate events. Corporate events finished within 24 hours of the financial crash. And I was around in 2001 in the corporate world when that had. Uh, so I'd been through several businesses disasters that gave me the knowledge to be able to execute and action what had to be done based on your analysis of how bad you thought it was very quickly. So I wrote that article to try and get other operators to carry out actions because the human instinct is to wait and see. And is this going to be as bad as we think, or we'll just not do that? Whereas every hour, every day, every week is critical when you have these situations, because if you don't take action, you're just burning cash, and all operators have a a limited supply of cash. So it was all about getting your business into a set, into a structure quickly that was going to be painful, but you needed to get your business where you were not burning cash, because I knew we were going to have a period of not generating cash. So... The actions I took were things that I had to do in 2008. But the main thing to me was to get the financial situation. Unfortunately, we let people go straight away within hours. By the time I was back from Berlin, people had been gone. So it's hard and it's difficult. But if you think the future is not going to be good to your business, you have a duty to try and protect that business as much as you can. It's survive first above everything because if you don't survive you've got nothing going going forward and that's why I was able to free up time to try and help others because within a week my businesses were in the state they needed to be which was a damn sight smaller than the way I started but I knew that gave me a, a runway of 12 to 18 months. I remember you telling me that you effectively closed down your international business but Splash your rafting business did very well during the summer. Yeah I made the judgment that local would work And it was a judgment at that point because we didn't know if it would or not. And the the actual reality was it worked sort of because we are not in control and the virus is not in control. It's actually the reactions of the powers that be, the governments, et cetera, who set 
set the rules, they're the ones in control. So we managed to get a local market for about 115 days out of 2020, which spread from the 4th of July until the 31st of October was the period we got to operate. And during that period, uh, when the build up to it, when I seen it was going to happen, we changed our whole business to focus on obviously local business that we weren't going to get our international clients. We also had to change who our clients were because we are a group focused business and we weren't allowed to take groups where our whole business, that business was focused on big groups of stag guys, kind of for when big hen parties, big corporate groups, big military groups, big school groups, big youth groups and groups, anything from 16 to 30 to 50 to 100, we just weren't going to be able to do with them. So we had to change the whole thing to focus on locals. And when I say local, it's UK is local for me because that's 60 odd million people. And we focused the whole summer on families. We just went for the family market for the, for the whole summer. And how did you market your business to locals? We didn't have enough time to SEO the Google presence in a way that was going to have an impact in a way that was going to be quick enough. And whatever work I did SEO, changing the content to focus on families was not going to get the rankings quick enough. So we did create family content, but then we went after the families on Facebook, backed it up with links to webs and links to other pages rather than relying on, relying on SEO. So the whole, the whole strategy was based around reaching out to, on Facebook, both organically and paid, to target customers in certain geographies that we thought that would pay back, and, and it did. And obviously, some things worked, some things didn't. Things that didn't, we killed. The things that worked, you'd double down on it, see if it still works, double down a bit more, and then you would find the point where you can't go beyond because it's not working anymore. So Facebook was basically the saviour of our cash flow during the summer. And you say we, did you hire someone to run your Facebook ads or was that you and your team running those? No, that was me in the office guy. Over the years, I've spent a lot of time on Facebook ads, so I have an idea how to execute the ads. But this was a bit more challenging than normal because we weren't chasing your normal customer profile. So I had to change. Some of the geographies weren't changed, but we were actually change, changing the message, changing the customer profile. So it was a bit different from what we had done previously. So there was a lot more experimenting to be had quickly. And when I say experiment, get the ad up for a couple of days, judge the engagement, judge the return, kill the ad if it's not working, and can double down on the ones that are working. So it was all a bit fast and furious. You can't hang about and make it perfect in the world we're in at the moment, where is it survival first? You can't be perfect. You just have to do what needs doing and then see if it's working. And if it isn't working, change it. I know you're busy and you got a lot of projects on, but my suggestion to you is, you should come up with some lectures on how you used Facebook during these times because you make it sound very easy and we all know it's not. And it's a very easy way to burn money if you don't know what you're doing. And I've burned a lot of money on Facebook and I won't say how much, but it was a lot <laughs> to learn how to do it. The one thing I would say is actually fairly easy to learn the technical aspects of Facebook. And I can tell you now, most of the marketing companies are way better on the technical right. aspects of Facebook than I am. So it's quite easy. But a lot of people don't think about the psychology side and their customer journey. Who is your customer? What is the journey they're going through? And what is their psychology? Because if you think about the psychology of your customer in debt, the content that you're going to deliver is going to be different. Facebook is not like Google where they're searching. You're interrupting them. So you're being rude. So you're dropping an ad on them. So basically you're being rude. So that's not a good good opening gambit for a customer. So you best have really thought that through to make sure that what you drop on them is inspiring enough and is aligned with them enough that they're going to give you the privilege of engaging with you. And that's about reading people and reading the psychology of people and matching the right people to the right content, to the right product, which you deliver. Now, that's quite hard to do. And you need to spend a lot of time with people and understanding people how to do that. And it's a combination of that and the technical side that you can get from all the agencies that is the difference between really successful ads and travel and non-successful ads. And the reason you don't see OTAs and bigger companies doing well on Facebook is it's very simple. They don't have a personal connection with the customer. Social media gives you, as an operator, the chance to have a one-to-one -one relationship with a customer. That is gold. That is absolute gold. 
And OTAs are really, really bad at that. Big companies are really bad at that. Customers, guests, automatically know whether they're dealing with a small company. Psychologically, they know this is a small company or this is a big company. And if you've got the opportunity to engage with them and create a relationship with them, and as a small business, they know that and they respect it. And the opportunity is, uh, this is no math figures, if you're engaging with 135 people in social and they're talking about you, that's having the same social impact as a brand with 1 million followers. So just 135 people engaging with you on social has the same impact as a brand with 1 million followers. That's not my numbers, that's Salesforce's research and numbers. I was always surprised here in the summer where I live in Vermont. There's a lot of outdoor activities. We're very much an out. I know you visited Vermont before. And I didn't see any ads for any activities or experiences. Bear in mind, I can see a giant big lake from my window here. There's a lot going on. And I wrote to our tourism department. I wrote to our governor. And I'm like, why are we not teaching our operators and experience providers how to use Facebook? Because there's a massive opportunity here. And I'm not saying it's the same everywhere. But I was really shocked in Vermont. Also, as you know, I've recently started learning how to cross-country ski. I've not had one single ad in my Facebook feed. I'm paying good money for those lessons. And I paid for a season pass for myself and my wife, right? I mean, they're doing well out of me. But I haven't seen one single ad for anyone who's doing anything to do with outdoors in Vermont. And it just blows my mind. Yeah, and it's, there's lots of reasons for that. It is, if you just jump on there as an operator and do it yourself, and you've never touched this before, and you're not overly digital, I'm telling you now, you're going to burn cash. You're just going to throw cash away and you're not going to get any business. It is a difficult platform to master. So if you're not that type of person, you're going to need to get help with this. That's for sure. You need to engage an agency. But I do question when you are engaged in an agency, just remember they'll be brilliant, should be, at the technical stuff and make sure you speak to people before and get the reviews. But you need to think through who is your customer. You need to know who your customer is and you need to work through the psychology of that customer. So you're putting the right things in front of them that are not pissing them off and they're inspiring them and it gets them to engage. And when they engage, you have to engage back. And when people are leaving comments and and statements, you can't just leave that there. You have to start that relationship, get back to them and engage with them. And don't just drop a web link onto them and try and get them on your website, as many agencies will tell you to do. They're comfortable in the environment they're in leave them in the environment they're in. If a customer is contacting you in WhatsApp, leave them in WhatsApp. If it's email, do it by email. If it's phone, stay in phone. Keep them in the environment they're comfortable in. Don't take them to the environment that you want because that's you doing it for your benefit, not for the customer's benefit. Just changing tracks here. During COVID, I said you spoke to hundreds of operators. What worried you the most? What were you hearing from operators where you're thinking, wow, we've got a major problem here? What weren't operators getting that they needed to do? Several things that I was surprised, and and this is not a failing of it, it's just what it is. People have gone into this for passion, for love, for the product they've done. But the lack of basic business knowledge across the operator base is quite substantial. And it doesn't matter what jobs they've come to before, but the ability to run can profit and losses, the ability to manage finance, to make sure the business is structured in a way that, one, it's making money. 2019 was the best year ever in travel. But I spoke to so many operators that didn't make any money in 2019. And they did 10 or 20,000 customers. So if you're doing thousands of customers and you're not making money in the best year travel has ever had, there's other things wrong, and it's a business model, and it's the financial model. So I was a bit taken aback by how the basics weren't taken care of from a business point of view. And then the other thing, especially from city-based operators, were how they had a distribution system and a distribution mix that left them exposed massively because too much business was coming from this platform or that platform, and they hadn't built any resilience into their business. So it wouldn't have took COVID to damage their business. Even a small disaster would have damaged a business, not COVID by any means. But I think the main takeaway was The financial models many operators are running are not viable long term. Wow. Wow. That is very surprising to hear. It's understandable. I've I've been a bit there myself. You you get so engrossed with your product and you've got more customers coming through the door. It's the busy fool syndrome. 
And we strunk our business back down to 10,000 customers for 20,000. And we make more money at 10,000 than we did at 20,000. At 20,000, we were busy fools. And at 10,000, we can make good money. Again, so it's very easy to get caught up in the life of looking after customers and more customers and more customers and more customers. But if the model isn't correct, I'm not building a resilient business because there's no inherent resilience in it if something happens. I know we're going back to OTAs, but there's so many operators out there, particularly city-based, who are into OTAs for 60, 70, 90% of the business. That's just not a long-term viable business. It's funny, I've never shared this with you, Peter. You know, like I said, I've been lucky enough to get to know you over the last couple of years, but the first time I came across you were in my days when I was regional director at Get Your Guide, and I would pop onto LinkedIn and see this Scotsman having a, what I perceived as having a go at OTAs, and your post used to piss me off. <laughs> <laughs> but I could never respond because I wasn't allowed because I worked for a corporate, right? And don't get me wrong, I think OTA is a fantastic business. You all love OTAs. I think they're brilliant. Yeah. Again, to build a platform, give the reach, can let millions of operators around the world or hundreds of thousands of small operators enable them to actually get customers quickly, it's fantastic. But that simplicity of it has an inbuilt weakness. If I'm a brand new operator and I open up in Bangkok tomorrow and I have 200 customers in my first week because of the OTAs, they think business is easy. Oh, look, I've created a business. <laughs> you haven't learned the basics of building a business because the business has come too easy. So OTAs can be a weakness and a strength. And obviously, they're a huge. I use OTAs. My business has got OTAs. But you've got to make sure your business is built in a resilient manner, that you've got enough cash flows coming from all these different channels that make sense that release a profit at the bottom. Because if it's not doing it and you've subcontracted core bit of your business, you're just going to get pain at some point. But OTAs are not going to weigh. They're here for, for good. There's going to be more of them. You're going to get niche ones that niche down and be very good in niches. And then you're going to get the global giants who are going to keep on growing. I mean, they're not growing at the moment for obvious reasons. But as we recover, they will be able to capture market share quicker than operators were. You're not going to be able, unless you're big, you're not going to be able to strike up a personal relationship with the OTA. So it's up to you to manage how you work with the OTA and make sure you're in control of that relationship, not the other way around. Do you think they'll ever crack the local booking code? So obviously, I think we both agree that international is pretty much gone for this year. If OTAs are to make any revenue, they need to get locals booking local activities which is a huge U-turn for them. Do you think they can do that? They can do a better job of what they're doing at the moment because they've got the resources for the content, for the branding and the marketing at the right place at the right time for when the customer's there. So they can make inroads for sure. But they're not going to dominate it like they can, they can do on, they don't even dominate international, but they're not going to make as big inroads because a local is a local and a local knows a lot about local places. I'm not going to use an OTA to book something that's 10 miles away from here or 15 miles away because I'm just going to book because I know it's there or word of mouth and from your social, from your network, from your friends. People are not going to use OTAs at the same scale for local business, but for sure they can do a much better job than what they do at the moment and they will do. That's, that's a given. They will invest in this because it's not wasted investment for them because if they manage it this year, they can carry it on into the other years. Local's not just going to disappear from local and then go international again. We're going to be in this confusing state for several years of and building back international. I would argue if I was in an OTA at the moment, I would be seriously building local because I think this is here for a lot longer than people think. And it gets me thinking, is it now an opportunity for the more specialized local tour? Let's say you're in New York and you have a pizza tour. Well, they don't really sell well on the large OTAs because internationals coming into New York City want to go to the Statue of Liberty or One World Observatory. Is it now the time for these smaller, more specialist tours that they could actually generate more bookings through the OTAs? Because that's what locals want to do. They want to go on a pizza tour. Yeah, locals are going to want to do stuff that they haven't done before. And we've seen that in the three months that we got open. I was speaking to the customers because I was back in the operation. I was like, why are you here? Would you normally be here? And why did you decide to come here? How did you find us? The answer was, oh, we wouldn't normally be here. We'd normally be in Greece, Spain, whatever. But we were looking for stuff to do that we wouldn't normally do. So that's them saying like, yeah, I've been to all the sites and the scenes because I am a local. Therefore, I have to find things that we wouldn't normally do 
because they're locals. That's what they're looking. They're not going to go to the thing that all the tourists go to. They're going to go to things that they're going to enjoy and they've never done before. So it gives the long tail of the industry all of the products and experiences that aren't the high volume stuff. This is an opportunity for them to really actually grow their customer base because people are looking for this long tail in this COVID and COVID times for the next few years. People are looking for the long tail. That's not to say the big attractions won't come back. Of course, they will. people will always go to the number one attractions again, wherever they travel. But at the moment, people are looking for the long tail experiences. Yeah, there's two ways of looking at that. You could have the locals saying, well, hang on. Now, for instance, you know, Empire State Building isn't packed with tourists. Now it's a good time to go. And I know I was talking to Rob at Trip Hacks DC, and he was taking pictures of the monuments there in Washington saying, hey, look, there's no crowds. Come visit. So there is that appeal to locals. But the toughest things in, in my career at an OTA, is my time at Get Your Guide, was speaking to a small operator and saying, look, I'm really sorry. It's, you've got an excellent tour here. Let's say a food tour. It's just not going to sell on the platform. And I'd have to turn them away or they would go live and they'd be ringing up, hey, where's the bookings? Where's the bookings? You're not giving me any bookings because the OTAs just weren't focusing on that. So I, I do wonder if it's, we're going to see a shift there. Like I say, I don't think it's wasted time from them shifting to do it because if they do capture a percentage of local, they can keep it as time goes on. So I don't think it's, it's all about getting the customer into your network in the first place. Once you've got that customer, you have a chance of retaining that customer. And we all know how OTAs acquire customers, and they're happy to acquire customers at losses all at the time because they can make it over the long lifetime journey of that customer. I can't believe none of the OTAs will not be going after this because what else are they going to do? They're just going to sit there and wait for COVID to be over. Well, I saw a job ad go out from Peak, funnily enough, and they were advertising for a head of B to C. Now, I know on your Travel Mavericks show, uh, you're going to be speaking to the leadership at Peak, but it just made me, you know, raise my eyebrows and think, well, are Peak going to get into being an OTA, which they were years ago, and are they going to focus more on the, the locals? Rizwana said at Arrival they'd had an excellent summer because so many of their customers are outdoors, adventure, nature, etc. Is that something they're looking at? I don't know. I have no intelligence or data on that. I just saw the job spec and thought, wow, interesting, B2C. Yeah, in this world, it makes sense. And none of us really know the outcome of this. Like, we all know travel's coming back, but we don't know when and we don't know how and we don't know in what scale. Pandemics can run for long periods of time, so you have to cover your bases. And I just believe anybody in the, our industry who's not, focusing on local is missing a trick that may come back and bite them on the backside. But local was here all the time. I mean, I've been surprised. My business, the one in Scotland, did local groups. We targeted the UK for groups and internationally for groups. But I had ignored families. And now I'm not going to ignore families going forward because I have learned families are a very viable business model for my business. Now, when these families end up going back to Spain or back to Greece, I may lose some of that potential volume again but there's still enough of them locally to be a viable business model plus you know those kids they get older and they're in what a fun time they had rafting with you and they come back yeah and you also got to think through the potentials of the different scenarios of the future scenario planning which i've ranted on before that operators don't do enough of and you have to have a scenario what is going to happen going forward here scenario one scenario two scenario three we could get international back but it may be very difficult you may have to be vaccinated. You may have to go through various tests to get on the plane, various tests to get back on the plane. You may have to still go into quarantine. We don't know all of that. Travel may be difficult. If it's difficult, people will travel less. They won't not travel. But if they were doing four international trips a year, they may only do two or they may only do one. What are they going to do with the rest of the time? The rest of the time, they'll still want to do stuff, but that's going to be local because it's too painful to go on the international journey. What's your verdict on virtual experiences? Yeah, they're here to stay, for sure. So getting back to the beginning of this conversation, digital first world. We are in a digital first world. Digital experiences are here to stay of every type. They're going to change, and they're going to change fast. So these virtual experiences have got their place, certainly got the place at the moment where everybody locked down, and it all comes down to... What are you trying to do for the guest? And guest first, as always, customer-centric. What are you trying to do? How is this helping your guest's experience? How is helping the guest? If you can answer them questions, the next question is, 
can I actually create these things at a scale and a quality that's going to enhance my guest? And what is my aim of doing it? Am I doing it to make money? Or am I doing it to engage them so I have a higher conversion rate when they can travel again? It's not a straightforward answer, this. These things are here to stay. Some people will do brilliant with them because they're just naturals. Some people won't get engaged with them at all. And some operators will spend some time and money and not, not really get a return out of them. It's a difficult space because it's not an operator's expertise area. And at the end of the day, it's all about value. And you've heard this before. Again, we pay nine bucks to Netflix every month and you get billions of dollars of production value. You pay 15 bucks for a virtual tour. Yeah, you got a guide and they're doing the best job they can. But the value proposition is not correct at the moment in my opinion, on virtual tours. Therefore, it comes back, is the operator willing to invest in them to make them part of the overall value proposition of the whole experience of that customer relationship rather than expecting a return just from that virtual tour on its own? Even that word virtual tour could mean different things. For instance, you know, the first few I did were pretty much Zoom talks with some slides, the 15 bucks point. I also went on three different Amazon experiences, tours, very different tours, one in Taiwan, one in Prague, one in Berlin. They are priced at that time, because I know they keep changing the pricing around the $90 mark, which is, is high. However, when I went on those tours, particularly the one in Berlin, for me, I thoroughly enjoyed it, Peter, because it was a live feed. The guy was on location, knew his stuff, and he actually grew up in East Germany, so he could go a lot deeper on some of my questions that I had from them, maybe most, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But I still asked myself, if I wasn't working in travel, or if I wasn't in this bubble, would I have handed over $90 for that tour? The answer is no. However, if somebody had gifted that to me and said, oh, I know Shane loves Berlin history. He's done me a favor. I'm going to send him that as a gift. I then go on and go, wow, that was brilliant. It was one-to-one, -one, got to see everything I wanted to see. Then I'm a convert. And I think that's the difficult thing right now for the consumer to understand that with virtual experiences. And also, you know, I'm hearing from out in the field that Amazon is wanting to bring the pricing down to below $50, which, as you know, then really crushes the, the revenue opportunity for the operator. So that's going to be fascinating to see what actually happens on the pricing side of things. I mean, they won't stay $50 for, for long. I mean, history tells us what's happened. If a product is digital and it scales to become a commodity, so it's successful, the price will go down. Because if you create digital products, eventually the price erodes to nothing. The bigger the scale, the more they erode to nothing. So if virtual tours are super uh, successful, the price will hit the floor. And that's how digital works. And that's how, and that's how Amazon works. So this stuff needs to be carefully thought out. But if you take your example of the guy in Berlin, if I was a customer who had been wishing to go to Berlin, had a passion to visit Berlin, I'd spent my 90 bucks on that and seen that. When I go to Berlin, the chances are I'm going to hire that guide. Yeah. And it's about building relationships. The, the toughest thing in travel, as we all know, is because it's a non-repeat purchase on a regular basis, it's how do you create that relationship that is relevant to the customer on a regular basis. If the customer only has a travel experience once or twice a year, how do you stay relevant in that customer's mind for all of that period? It's not like you've got a relationship with Amazon where you've got Amazon Prime or a relationship with Netflix to get your films or you go to the gym and you've got a relationship with them. We have a relationship with customers or customers are coming into the travel industry once or maybe twice a year or once every two years. Therefore, it is a difficult decision for operators about how much they invest in creating that acquiring of the customer virtually to try and then convert them into a real customer and face-to-face -face where the real value is. Yeah, because you say that, like I know that the company who ran that tour in Berlin, but that's because we work in this industry. If I was Joe Public, I would just think it's Amazon. <laughs> so, yes. you know, that's, yes. that's a struggle there, I think. And also the other, the other thing I ponder a lot, speaking to a few people who've done these experiences. So for myself, I wouldn't book an experience for a place I know I'm going to visit. So let's say I've always wanted to go and see the Sydney Opera House. Well, I want to wait till I can see it with my own eyes, right? But there are other people out there that are like, oh, no, no, I want to go and do all that first so I know when I get to destination what I want to go and, and check out. So that's fascinating, the different consumer patterns. This, it's early days here. You've got to remember, this stuff's going to 
we're going to go off in all sorts of directions. And um, we've just gone through a period where everybody's separate and not seeing family, not seeing relations, not seeing parents, not seeing children. I haven't seen my kids for months. And when we get out of this and we start traveling, Ian, what if we were traveling and could do a virtual experience that was being back to your mother who's sitting in the house? Yeah. And to engage with the family that you've not been engaged with all the time. Your mother can't come with you to Berlin, but if she was 10 years younger, she would have loved to be in Berlin. Can you have a, an experience that is real and virtual at the same time? We're, we're at early days of where this is going. This, this is going a long, long way. We've just opened the door on this stuff and everything to do with virtual, digital, online experiences, blending into real experiences is just at the very early days. This has got a long way to run. But what was cool was the, the Taiwan tour that I did was a tea tour, organic tea. And I ended up spending probably 50 or $60 buying this guy's tea. It wasn't set up through Amazon. It will be at some stage of that, I have no doubt. But, you know, he then made that bit of money off me because having seen all these tea leaves and how they've grown and how great he said it tasted, then I wanted to order it because I want to taste it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a merger of travel and commerce and purchase and e-commerce. And that's going to be a huge industry. And we're not talking kind of a few million here or there. We're talking billions. Travel experiences merging with e-commerce purchases is going to be off the scale. And that is why, funny enough, Amazon is interested. Because if you can create these fantastic experiences and then relate them to products that can be purchased at the press of a button at the end of that experience or halfway through that experience, it's going to drive sales. Peter, I want to be respectful of your time. I could speak to you for hours, my friend. and I know our listeners could listen to you for hours because very engrossing conversation. You always say things to make us think about the industry. One of the questions I have for you is you've written a fair bit in the past about wanting to create more transformational experiences for your customers. And I'm talking post COVID. What are you planning next for your business? What's the next steps for you? For the international business, when we restart it, and when I say I'm restarting it, I've started marketing for 2022. I'm taking bookings for 2022. Fingers crossed that that can happen. So think in the terms of inputs and outputs. Myself and other people in the industry, we're reasonably good at inputs. We will create the environment, wherever in the world it is. We will create the experience they're going to get. We look after their food. We look after their accommodation. We look after, can the chat in my case, it's a challenge. So we're pretty good at creating inputs that inspire guests and guests love what we do and they give you good reviews and all that stuff. But I'm more and more saying, is that enough? We've given them a great experience, but travel can be so, so much more. As well as being immersed in the environment, immersed with the locals, immersed with the challenge or the experience you're doing, I'm starting to be a lot more interested in what the outputs are. And the outputs for the customer, the outputs for the destination and the locals in the destination, and the outputs for the actual guest on it. So certainly any guests that go on our expeditions in the future are long expeditions. We do little short ones as tasters to see if we like them and they like us. If anybody signs up on a month or two months or three months, we're going to go through a process with them where they actually have to tell us why they want to come on this expedition personal to them. What are they trying to get out of it? We're not looking, oh, I just want the challenge. That's not an answer. That's part of it. But we really want to start to get into what are they trying to achieve doing this travel experience? Why are they doing it? What do they want to experience? Where do they want to experience that? What life-changing experience is coming out of that? And this is sort of developed from things we've seen happen in the past. We've had people get divorced, people get married, people leave their jobs en masse. Virtually everybody comes in on expeditions to leave jobs. People start businesses. So all these things were happening on our expeditions. But it wasn't because of the expeditions. It was people who had been thinking about stuff prior to coming on the expedition. And then we gave them the environment and the time to actually think about stuff. And then they took actions after the expedition. So we're going to take all of that and formalize it up a bit more to actually have a process that we work with each guest that's on the expedition, not just to deliver everything we have delivered before, but actually give a personalized customer experience to that guest to try and help them achieve what's going on in their life back home when they get back there. Love it. Love that idea, Peter. And 
I think many of us listening would love it as well and would love to come and join you, especially when we have to make big decisions, whether it's about our family life, our home life, or you know what we want to do with our businesses. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, that's not a niche market. Every single person in the world has personal challenges with what they want to do, when they want to do it, and how they want to do it. And we've, we all go through these things. These are part of life. But the stress of life, of being in work and kids and family, you never get any time, and time's the most valuable thing in the world, People don't get the time to decouple from the internet, from social. Uh, and our expeditions certainly give them time because they're long. It's how about can we best put use to that time? Everybody will have a journal. Everybody will have to take notes every day. And are you getting answers to your questions? Are you not getting answers to your questions? What do we need to go uh, discuss through more? And time is the most valuable thing in the world. I've got 258 months left to live. Therefore, I need to make the most of them 258 months. Wow. Before I let you go, for our listeners out there, entrepreneur listeners who are struggling, they're not sure what to do next with their businesses, what's your final piece of advice, Peter? Just remember what you're in. You're in the travel industry and you're in the best part of the travel industry. Right? The travel industry is fantastic. It's the best industry in the world and you're in the best sector of it because you get to deal face to face with guests, make them smile, make them have a great time. They've been stressed, they've had bad times, they've had illness, they've had death this year. You get them to give them the best time of their year. They may only have one week, they may only have two. So you're in a privileged position because you're in the travel industry. You may be finding it difficult at the moment because of all the things that's going on, but keep the faith. The travel industry will be back, and it's our job to make sure that we build it back that is going to do better for you as people in business but the only way you're going to do that is build it better back for your customers. So just think three simple things. What do you need to do to survive? Wherever such and the situation is different in different countries in the world. Australia and New Zealand are open at the moment and trading. And locally, other countries are shut down. What do you need to do to survive? How do you align with the new customer trends and new customer actions? And what do you need to create that's going to let you thrive in the future? rather than feeling you're just on that hamster wheel of customer in, customer out, customer in, customer out, and not making any money. Fantastic. Well, Peter, thank you very much for sharing your your wisdom. I, I heed your warning of earlier on, but I ask all of our listeners to follow you and read your observations and insights, and they won't go far wrong. Where is the best place for people to follow you online? Uh, LinkedIn, without a doubt. I mean, I use Facebook a lot for business, but I don't use it a lot for personal. Brilliant. I will add that link to today's show notes. Cheers, Peter. And I look forward to, at some point, I'm guessing it's going to be 2022, where we can have a few beers together. Maybe it'll be March in Berlin next year. It'll certainly be somewhere sometime. I'm 100% confident of that, Shane. And thanks, Shane, for all the effort you've put in with the daily email. That email's uh, God sent to me. Uh, it saves me collecting information and doing Google searches and all the rest of the stuff. Your email every day gets read. Uh, so thanks very much for putting that back to, uh, together every day. It's, it's a great thing. Thank you, Peter. I really appreciate it. Cheers now. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.